these are the same promises that he's been making for nine years. And instead of a the theoretical utopia that he's promised, what Canadians are living through is hell with tent cities popping up across the country in places they never existed before, with two million people lined up in food banks, one in ten Torontonians included in that number, in a town where right now it is impossible for almost anyone to afford a home, and there are 256 tent cities. Why won't he recognize that these are the very real consequence of his policy of wackonomics? Mr. Speaker. This parliamentary session, we once again saw that everything in Canada is broken. Housing costs have doubled. Millions of Canadians are going to food banks. 25% of Canadians, a record level, are living in poverty after nine years of this Liberal Prime Minister, with the support of the Bloc Québécois. Is this Prime Minister going to force Canadians to suffer for another 18 months of this hell? Or will he call elections right now? so that Canadians can elect a government that will cut taxes, build housing, fix the budget, and stop the crime. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, if the leader of the Conservative Party really cared about the affordability crisis, he would support our dental care plan for seniors and youth. He would be helping us to support 400,000 children a year so that they can access school food programs. He would be supporting our measures to make more child care spots available. He would be supporting our ambitious plan to increase housing and densification. But instead, he's playing petty partisan games instead of delivering for Canadians. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition, Mr. Speaker. We've already seen what these policies are like for nine years. They are causing the poverty and problems that I talked about earlier. And now he wants to force Quebec to shut down the forestry sector. We learned from the Quebec Natural Resources Ministry that this may kill up to 30,000 jobs, but the Bloc Québécois doesn't have a single word to say against it. Will this Prime Minister put an end to this radical decree so that we can save the jobs of 30,000 Quebec workers? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, unlike the leader of the Conservative Party, Quebecers know very well that the only way to build a stronger future is by protecting both the economy and the environment at the same time. That is how we will create a more prosperous future for Quebecers and all Canadians. But once again, we see that the Conservative Party has an anti-environmental approach. We will continue to work with the government of Quebec. We will continue to work hard to protect forestry jobs and to protect caribou. That is what people expect from a responsible government. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. What this session of Parliament taught us is that after nine years of this Prime Minister, everything is broken. 25% of Canadians are now living in poverty. Two million lined up at food banks. 38% more people are homeless. The housing costs have doubled. It wasn't like this before this Prime Minister, and it won't be like this after he's gone. Will he put us through another year and a half of this costly hell, or will he cause, call a carbon tax election today so we can elect a common-sense government to axe the tax, build the homes, fix the budget, and stop the crime? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, if the Leader of the Opposition actually cared more about Canadians than he does about his own political interests, he'd be supporting uh, the 400,000 kids working to help with the National School Food Program. He'd be voting in favour, instead of opposing at every turn, uh, the dental care program that has already helped over 200,000 seniors and will now, uh, as of next week, start helping uh, young people and Canadians with disabilities. He'd be standing with us on expanding childcare spaces instead of campaigning against it. But Mr. Speaker, he doesn't care about Canadians. He cares only about himself.
the honorable leader of the opposition. Speaker, these are the same promises that he's been making for nine years. And instead of a, the theoretical utopia that he's promised, what Canadians are living through is hell with tent cities popping up across the country in places they never existed before, with two million people lined up in food banks, one in ten Torontonians included in that number, in a town where right now it is impossible for almost anyone to afford a home, and there are 256 tent cities. Why won't he recognize that these are the very real consequence of his policy of wackonomics? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, as part of our plan to invest to the, most in, uh, the most ambitious housing plan this country has ever seen, to invest uh, in supports for seniors, supports for young people, uh, supports uh, for Canadians with disabilities, uh, the Conservative leader is choosing to demonstrate what everyone knows Conservative parties do, which is protect the wealthiest and let everyone else fend for themselves. While we are asking the wealthiest Canadians to pay a little bit bit more by raising the capital gains inclusion rate for anyone making over $250,000 in a given year on selling properties. He's standing with the wealthiest, not with the middle class and people working hard to join him. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, the middle class doesn't exist after nine years of this Prime Minister. Here are the facts. 76 per cent of young people believe they'll never afford a home. 38 per cent more homeless people. 256 homeless encampments in Toronto alone. Two million people lined up at a food bank. One in four Canadians skipping meals because they can't afford the price of food. Is this what he meant when he said sunny ways for the middle class? Yeah. <laughs> The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we've seen throughout this session and indeed throughout his career, uh, covering more than 19 years as a parliamentarian, that the leader of the Conservative Party is very quick to use sound bites that use Canadians that exacerbate and exaggerate and indeed amplify the real concerns people are facing, but he is nowhere on solutions for them. He's standing against dental care, against pharmacare, against investments in the middle class and people working hard to join it, in, against investments to create jobs and a future for Canadians, because all he cares about is himself and his future. He was also forced to release data from his own government showing that there would be a $30 billion a year hit to our economy as a result of his job-killing carbon tax, data that he had up until then been hiding. He's been going around claiming that Canadians are better off because they pay this tax. Did the calculations that went into his 8 out of 10 talking points include this $30 billion a year cost to the Canadian economy and to Canadian families? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker. The Parliamentary Budget Officer has confirmed that 8 out of 10 Canadians in jurisdictions that have the federal carbon price in them get more money back from the Canada carbon rebate than they pay with this price on pollution. That is fact. Now, the Conservative leader has been using erroneous figures that the Parliamentary Budget Officer has said he made a mistake on to uh, continue uh, to, attack his, uh, to attack our plan on fighting climate change and putting more money back in people's pockets. Eight out of ten Canadians are better off, Mr. Speaker. Here, here. Right. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Does that include the $30 billion a year economic cost when distributed among those eight out of ten families? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, once again, 
The Conservatives are basing their attacks on climate action and affordability on erroneous calculations that the Parliamentary Budget Officer has admitted that he made. The fact uh, that the Parliamentary Budget Officer uh, also calculated without making any mistakes that 8 out of 10 Canadians are better off with the Canada carbon rebate and the price on pollution means that we are not only fighting climate change and bringing down emissions, we're also putting more money back in the pockets of Canadians who need support here, here, right now. Here. Money that exactly. the Conservative Party wants to take away. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. I'm not using parliamentary budget officer numbers. Oh, oh, oh. I'm using numbers that this Liberal government has now published. This government has admitted that their carbon tax will hit Canadians with $30 billion in annual losses to wages and higher prices. That is their data. They published it. So once again, a very specific question. When he claims that 8 out of 10 are better off, does that include the $30 billion of costs that he now admits that the government will impose on the economy? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Speaker, I don't know how much clearer I can be, but I'll try. Based on everything this government knows, all the studies we've made, all the studies that the Parliamentary Budget Officer has made, we can affirm very clearly, and it's backed up by independent economists, that eight out of ten families in jurisdictions across the country where the federal price on pollution applies do better off with more money in their pockets than the price on pollution costs them with the Canada carbon rebate. It's quite Canadians, and if the Conservatives are wrong on this. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. He can't say yes, because he knows that when you take the $30 billion a year and divide it by the 17 million Canadian families, then you come up with almost $2,000 per Canadian family based on numbers published by his own government. So it's like him saying, you can afford this house as long as you don't take into consideration the down payment and the monthly mortgage payments. <laughs> you take out $30 billion of costs, you don't have a real calculation. So why doesn't he put the $30 billion back into the calculator and show Canadians whether they're really better off? Yeah. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. It is actually quite stunning to see the leader lay it out so clearly that all of his math depends on one factor that he believes, which is climate change isn't real, according to the Leader of the Opposition. That's the only way to make sure his math works. If he says there are no costs to Canadians of uh, extreme weather events, there are no costs to Canadians about degrading competitive competition uh, when the world is switching towards greener greener solutions. If you don't believe in climate change, then his math works. But if you know that climate change is a real threat to Canadians and the economy, then we need to act, and that's what we're doing. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. No, all you have to accept is the fact that his carbon tax will not reduce by one penny the cost of climate change to Canadians. It will not eliminate one flood, one drought, one storm, one anything. His carbon tax literally does nothing to change the weather or the climate. What it does is makes Canadians poor. So will he finally admit that all along he's been misleading Canadians, that he knew he had the data that Canadians pay more and get less and get screwed over by the carbon tax? I encourage all members uh, to uh, try to find uh, ways that are for polite, you know, polite words in the House of Commons. The Honourable Leader, the, the Right Honourable Prime Minister. Once again, Mr. Speaker, the only way 
the conservative leader's mouth makes sense is when he believes that climate change has no cost for Canadians. Canadians right across this country are seeing the impact of climate events, uh, the impact of uh, the need to innovate and create greener, cleaner jobs for the future as we deliver our resources to the world. The fact that he doesn't believe in climate change means that he doesn't believe the climate action that puts more money in people's pockets is worth it. Well, that's exactly where we disagree, and we're going to continue to help Canadians get through this. The Conservatives just want to protect their ultra wealthy buddies. That's not how we're going to get a better economy for everyone. After the position. Rich friends, people who make between fifty and hundred thousand dollars a year or two. Rich for him, I guess he wants to make them poor. He's succeeding at that. Yep. One in four, sorry, one in five Canadians uh, told Angus Reid that they will be affected, including one in five of people making between fifty and a hundred thousand dollars a year, Mr. Speaker. Another tax targeting the middle class by this promise-breaking Prime Minister. If those Canadians are wrong and they won't be affected, will the Prime Minister announce that he will amend his tax increase law to exclude anybody making less than a hundred thousand dollars a year? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, our increase to the capital gains inclusion rate will affect people who make more than $250,000 in profits when they sell successful investments within a given year. We feel that those people can make a slight less amount of profits so that we can make sure we're investing in young people who can afford housing, so that we help seniors with the cost of dental care, so we deliver free insulin and free uh, prescription contraceptives across this country. We're asking the wealthiest and the most successful to pay a little bit more so we can help those who need it, and the Conservatives are choosing to stand with the wealthy. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Socialist baffle gab. Not my words. Those are the words of Scott Bryson, oh. the former Liberal President of the Treasury Board, the very person to whom the Prime Minister trusted all of his spending. Add to that Bill Morneau and John Manley, two former finance ministers who have now said they are against this tax increase, and David Dodge, a Liberal former governor of the Bank of Canada. Now that all these Liberals say that the Prime Minister is up to social, uh, socialist baffle gab, will he reverse this job-killing tax on Canadians? Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, it should actually be no surprise to Canadians to see the Conservatives, after pretending to care about workers, after pretending to care about vulnerable people, revert to type and stand against and ask for the wealthiest to pay a little bit more in taxes so we can invest even more uh, in Canadians who need it, whether it's through a uh, national school food program, whether it's expanding places in child care, uh, whether it's uh, delivering dental care for seniors and Canadians with disabilities. These are all things the Conservatives stand against, just like they stand against asking the wealthiest to pay their fair share. That's a shame. So the Liberal Premier of Newfoundland says this Prime Minister's carbon tax will harm working class people just trying to heat their homes or drive to work. The former Liberal Finance Minister, which he appointed, says that this latest job-killing tax that he's brought in will drive investment out of the country. And the Liberal Treasury Board president that he appointed accuses the Prime Minister of socialist baffle gab. With Liberals accusing him of socialist baffle gab, will he just admit that he's actually not even a Liberal? He's Canada's first NDP Prime Minister. <laughs>
The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we have demonstrated over the past nine years uh, that investing in the middle class and people working hard to join it can create growth for the country, and that's why we're continuing to step up to put that growth for work by putting more money in the pockets of Canadians, whether it's through a plan to fight climate change that puts more money in the pockets of eight out of ten Canadian families uh, across the country, whether it's by moving forward on asking the wealthiest who are selling off profitable ex investments to share a little more of those profits with Canadians who need it by countering the housing crisis by investing in young people. But once again, Conservatives stand with the wealthiest. We stand with the middle class. Here, here. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Countering the housing crisis, he doubled housing costs, helping young people. 76% of them say they can't afford a home after nine years of this Prime Minister. But it's getting worse. The Prime Minister gave a half billion dollars to the Liberal NDP mayor and council at Toronto City Hall, supposedly to accelerate home building. What is the consequence? Since that money was handed over, Toronto City Hall has increased wait times and costs for building permits by 50 percent. Why does he keep forcing taxpayers to bloat the gatekeeping bureaucracies instead of doing what we want, build the homes? I know that we are coming to the end of the summer, uh, end of the session, uh, and members uh, by Friday, um, and that members sometimes there might be a little bit more excited. I'm going to ask all members to please not take the floor unless they're recognized by the chair, because uh, I can hear their voices pretty well. The honourable, uh, the right honourable prime minister. Mr. Speaker, the challenging fact that the Leader of the Opposition is trying to avoid is that uh, just last week it was demonstrated that housing starts are up across this country, and that is part of where we have been investing uh, with uh, communities across the country in the Housing Accelerator Fund that is delivering more homes built faster. Indeed, uh, we're going to see uh, close to 4 million new homes in the coming decade uh, because Canadians know that more density, better use of public lands, better protection for renters, uh, better uh, math for home builders to be able to build more affordable homes. These are the things that are going to make a difference in Canadians' lives. Here, here. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Better math? Well, I think we can all agree that Prime Minister <laughs> needs better math. But here is the math. The Altus Group says that Canada's, building, Canada's uh, development charges are significantly higher and our wait times for getting building permits are the second slowest in the entire OECD. And what is this Prime Minister doing? Giving half a billion dollars to the City of Toronto, which has just increased its development charges and its permit wait times by 50 percent. So once again, why does the Prime Minister keep funding the gatekeepers instead of removing them so we can build the homes? Again, I'm going to ask members, uh, particularly the member from Hamilton Centre, if he could please uh, not hackle people. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, here's a concrete example of how one makes the math work to build more homes. Uh, last year, we made a decision to take off the GST on purpose-built middle-income uh, apartment buildings, on the kind of apartment buildings we need more of right across the country. Uh, within a few days after having announced that we would no longer be charging the GST on uh, new apartment buildings, uh, thousands of new units were being announced by developers across the country because suddenly they were able to bring projects onto the table that hadn't been on it before. That's how you invest in housing. That's how you deliver for Canadians. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, permits take three times longer to get in Canada than in the U.S. and in the U.K., and in the last two years in Toronto, the wait time has gone from 21 months to 32 months, all while the Prime Minister has given that bureaucracy $500 billion to subsidize their building-blocking bureaucracy. Why won't he follow my common-sense plan to require municipalities permit 15 percent more housing completions as a condition of getting their federal funds? 
The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, let's be very clear. The Conservative leader has no plan to address the housing crisis. When he was Housing Minister under the Harper government, he had no plan to address the housing crisis. That government decided to get out of any federal engagement in housing, and we're seeing those consequences even 10 years later. The reality is, Mr. Speaker, that his plan to reimpose GST on apartment building construction would slow down apartment building construction. His plan to withdraw funds uh, that are needed for densification and permitting would slow down housing construction. That's not what Canadians need.